Okay, got it. Good. So I guess we can start. So uh, welcome back all to the next session of Itaca Fest, uh, the first after the summer break. I am very glad to be the, the, the chair today. There are two very interesting talks. And I will introduce the first speaker in a moment, but uh, uh, the, the important thing that I have to tell the audience is that uh, I have a good news. We have uh, a good news because there will be a, an in-person meeting. Uh, Itaca will meet in person in Turin in December. So save the date. It's going to be 18 and 19 December. So we all hope we are going to meet there and uh, um, it's going to be good as all the other meetings of Itaca. Now, let's start. The first speaker of today is Steve Owaday that will talk about algebraic type theory. Whenever you want, Steve, you have the words. Thanks very much, Fosco. Um, I'm sorry I won't be able to join you in December. I wish I could. Um, but thanks for having me here online now. Uh, it's a welcome invitation. I'm going to tell you today about an approach to Martin Luff type theory that I've been working on. It's a kind of an algebraicization of the Martin Luff type theory from a certain point of view. Um, let me have an introductory slide here. Here we are. We can make uh, models of Martin Luff type theory, meanwhile, in quill and model categories. That's something that people might have seen before. We've been working on that for some time. And the purpose of the quill and model category is to build a model of not just the Martin Luff type theory with the intentional identity types, but also the univalence axiom with a univalent universe. And that requires a quite delicate control over the constructions. And it turns out that the Martin Luff uh, uh, identity type and the connection to the weak factorization system in a Quillen model category is just the beginning of the story. And the story continues when you try to model univalence, you very much need the uh, rest of the Quillen model structure. So that's something we learned from Voivodsky and others and has been quite uh, developed quite thoroughly over the last 10 years or so. However, these models are what we might call homotopical models. They don't strictly model type theory in the sense of modeling all the operations such as the uh, uh, Beck-Chevalet conditions and strict pullbacks and coherence laws and so on. And so one would also like to have a stricter notion of a model of type theory with univalence and so on. And uh, that's given by something like a category with families or a contextual category, something along those lines. One of these notions that's been developed uh, by type theorists and others to strictly model the operations of the type theory. And what I'm going to show you today is a way of extracting from a homotopical model based on a Quillen model category or similar, extracting a strict model, which is in fact a category with families. And um, I'm going to do this for the cases of the sigma and pi identity type or sigma and pi type formers. And I'll mention the identity types along the way, but I won't really have time to do the full structure, but I think I'll do enough of it to give you an idea of how this works. And then at the end, if there's time, I'll take a bit higher perspective on what's going on and uh, uh, introduce the idea that this is in fact a polynomial monad. Um, I just heard a beep. I think that tells me I got some email that's not relevant information for you. Did you hear the beep too? Do I need to turn that off? No, no beep. Okay, good. Then I'm only hearing it here, so that's okay. Um, okay, so here that's the outline that I just gave you. So let's go on now. The system that I'm going to model, uh, if you're not completely familiar with it, or if you're wondering which fragment I'm talking about, I'm talking about the following. It has some basic types and terms, including variables and maybe some basic terms. And then it has dependent types and dependent terms, possibly in a context. And then it has construction rules for contexts from dependent types, substitutions between contexts, 
and then the type forming operations that I mentioned, the sigma and the pi. And then it has strict equations between terms. This is what the type theorists call judgmental or definitional equality. This is not the Martin Luff identity type, rather it's the strict equality of the system. So that's what I'm going to be modeling today. And here, just to make sure we're all on the same page, is a quick glimpse of the conventional rules for these operations and this structure. I'm not going to go through the whole thing, but you see it's the ones you're familiar with. If you've seen this before, this is how you build new contexts from old. This is how you introduce the type, type constructors and the terms, and you eliminate from them, and then there are the computation rules. Similarly, for the pi types, the products, there's a formation rule, an introduction rule, which tells you how to build a term, an elimination rule, which tells you how to use a term, and then some computation. And then there are the usual substitution conditions, which tells you that everything that you can, every judgment is stable under substitution into the context, okay? So that's the system that I'm going to be modeling. And the way I'm going to model it is this. I'm going to use a structure called a representable natural transformation. So here's the definition. I have a category C. I have a pre-sheaves X and Y over C and a map of pre-sheaves, which is a natural transformation. This is the categories um, uh, seminar, so I don't have to tell you the definitions of these things but you might not be familiar with the notion of a representable natural transformation. What that means is that, not that this map itself is in the image of the Yoneda embedding, but that if I take any element over a representable, right, by Yoneda, this is an element of X at C, and I make a pullback, I look at the fiber of the map over an element, then that fiber is itself in the image of the Yoneda embedding, a representable map in that sense. So that's the definition of a representable natural transformation. It comes from the Grotendieck school of algebraic geometry. It was used as a kind of finiteness condition in the theory of schemes. So I'm gonna make use of that notion. And in fact, what I'm going to show is that it's literally the same thing as the notion of a category with families in the sense of Peter de Bier who introduced that concept category with families as a model of Martin Luff type theory. So let's go through it. Wait a minute. There we are. I'm getting notices to admit people from the waiting room. Should I answer them? I guess I will. So the index category C, I'm going to regard as the category of contexts. I'll write the objects in C like this with capital Greek. And the substitutions are the maps. I'll write them with lowercase Greek. So that's part of the definition of a category with families. We have a category of contexts. And then on the category of contexts, we have a pre-sheaf of types in context. I'll write that as tie here. So for every context, there are the types in that context, and that forms a pre-sheaf. Then there's in the definition of a category with families, this idea of a pre-sheaf of typed terms, and that's a pre-sheaf over the category of elements of this pre-sheaf of types. So I make the category of elements of the pre-sheaf of types, I take its op and a contravariant functor there, and that's how they uh, begin the definition of a category with families. Now, as you know, the category of elements of a pre-sheaf has the property that pre-sheaves on it are equivalent to the slice of the original category over the thing that you're taking the elements of. This is a familiar, I hope, equivalence. So really, instead of taking this pre-sheaf of types and then taking its category of elements and taking a pre-sheaf on that, I can just take another pre-sheaf and a map down to this one. So that's what I'm going to do. Instead of taking the terms to be a pre-sheaf on the category of elements, I'll take the terms just to be another pre-sheaf on the contexts, 
together with an indexing map down to the pre-sheaf of types, okay? So rather than this, I'm going to use this. And of course, this is why I told you about representable natural transformations because this gadget is just a natural transformation. And now I'm going to assume it to be representable. So assume that my pre-sheaf there of types and terms is a representable natural transformation. And let's see what we can get out of that. So this again is the pre-sheaf of types in context. Now term is the pre-sheaf of terms in context. P gives the typing of the terms. So formally we say, if we have a type in context gamma, then that's an element of the pre-sheaf of types at gamma. We have a term, that's an element of the pre-sheaf of terms. And moreover, these elements of course, correspond by Yoneda to maps like this. Moreover, this term has type A, just if the triangle commutes. So the interpretation of this judgment in context gamma, the term A has the type big A is interpreted as a commuting triangle like this. That's the whole interpretation of that judgment, okay? Now we're going to make free use of the Yoneda lemma here going back and forth between elements and maps from representables. And there are gonna be quite a few representables around and since I'm writing these things as Greek anyway, I don't need to always put a Y in front of it. Whenever you see a Greek letter, it's a representable thing, okay? So I'm gonna drop the Y from now on. Having, there we are. Now, one of the laws of a category with families is that these judgments are stable under substitutions. So if I have a substitution sigma from a context delta into the context gamma, and I have a type in that context or a term in that context, then I can substitute into the type and into the term, and I get a new judgment in the context delta. Now, this rule of categories with families, the substitution stability, is modeled in our natural model like this. Here's the judgment that little a is a term of type big A. Here's the substitution we just pre-compose with sigma. That's the interpretation of substituting into the type and into the term. And then of course, the substitutions also form a commutative triangle because this was commutative and I just pre-composed with sigma. So that's the interpretation of the stability under substitution law of a category with families. And of course, given any further substitution, we have the, um, associativity here of composition and the unit law follow immediately just by precomposing with a tau here from a delta prime and then using associativity in our interpretation. So those laws follow immediately. So that's the basic structure of a category with families. And the only thing missing is the context extension. Now, I haven't shown you what a context extension rule is for categories with families, and I'm not going to because it's not the sort of thing one should do in public. It's not a pretty site, but it is a pretty site in the setting that we're using of representable natural transformations. This context extension law, which says, if I have a type in context gamma, I can form a new context, which is the old one extended by the type together with a projection map and some other structure, it looks like this. The extended context is simply the pullback of, of the natural transformation along A, and our axiom for representable natural transformations tells us that this gadget is also representable, and therefore, this is also a context. That's the context extension. This is a substitution of contexts, and if I substitute that into A, then I have a new context like this, and I have a term Q of type A with the substitution. And that's also part of the definition of a category with families is that substitution term. And there it is right there. It's a term of the substituted type. And now the fact that this square is a pullback 
gives us the two other laws for categories with families. I'm not going to go through the whole thing. If you're interested, you can look at it later. The fact that this is a pullback tells me that these laws for categories with families also hold in this situation. And the uniqueness of the pullback gives me the rest of the computation rules. So all of the laws for category with families in the sense of de Beer are implied by the condition that this map is a representable natural transformation. Now, what can we do with that? Well, first of all, I just want to mention that there's a connection between this and Joyelle's theory of clans and the notion of display map category due to Paul Taylor and the notion of a comprehension category. There are various different models of Martin Luff type theory around, and they can be related to each other in a neat way. And this particular notion of a natural model can be related, for example, to the theory of clans and display map categories in a particularly straightforward way. What I do is for every type and every context, so that's a thing like this, I take a pullback of P and that gives me a display map over gamma. That's this context extension. And now that's a fibration over C. The fibration of all display maps is a sub of the codomain projection. And it's a fibration itself because these things are all pullbacks and therefore they're pullbacks of each other. So it's a collection of maps closed under pullbacks and that's a display map category. I'm going to call that a pre-clan. It differs from Joyelle's notion of a clan by not necessarily being closed under composition. That's one of Joyelle's laws for a clan. We don't have to have that. So I'll call it a pre-clan. Conversely, if I have any such vibration, any such family of maps stable under pullback, there's an associated natural model, which I build just in this way. I take all the representables and I co-product them up in the pre-sheaves. And you might not be surprised to know that this is an adjunction. And what it's doing is it's taking the vibration and splitting it into a pre-sheaf. And that's a left adjoint to the forgetful functor from pre-sheaves to vibrations. And that's exactly what this operation is doing and what this one is doing. So there's your adjunction between the natural models and the Joyal style notion of clans. Now, what's nice about this notion of a natural model is that it's essentially algebraic in the technical sense. It's a finite limit theory or a generalized algebraic theory in the sense of Cartmel or a dependently typed algebraic theory. And what that means is that these things have a canonical notion of a homomorphism, and that corresponds exactly to a syntactic translation of type theories, types to types, terms to terms, context to context, context extension operation is preserved. So there's a very good algebraic category of these things and their homomorphisms. There are free algebras. There's an initial algebra. If you give me some basic types and terms of type theory, I can crank out the free algebra. And the way that I do it is I apply the rules of type theory. So the rules of type theory can be seen as a procedure for generating the free algebras. So that's a very nice way of looking at this uh, point of view, I think. And now you might wonder, what about the type formers like the sigma and the pi? Can I just throw those in as some basic types and basic terms and then make the free algebra over that. Well, that's usually the way that one thinks about it in the from the point of view of categories with families. You throw in a bunch of new terms and type formers and equations, and that gives you the sigma types. And you do the same thing for the pi types and so on. But what I want to tell you is that there's a kind of higher way of looking at what's going on there uh, from the point of view of natural models now. And I want to explain that to you briefly. Uh, Mr. Chairman, will you please remind me of the time? Do I go until 3.30? Uh, yes, you have 11 okay. minutes. Okay, good. That's good. So in order to give you the higher point of view, let me remind you what a polynomial endofunctor is. On any locally Cartesian closed category, like pre-sheaves, if you have a map, it determines an endofunctor 
which you can write in the internal locally Cartesian closed type theory of this category in this form. The polynomial endofunctor applied to a presheaf can be written in this form. That's why it's called a polynomial because it looks like a polynomial. Um, more functorially, the description is this. Here's my polynomial endofunctor. What I do is I take some object X, some presheaf, I pull it back to, oh, I've switched notation on you. Let me just warn you. For any polynomial endo, for any natural model, it doesn't have to be called terms and types. It's just a representable natural transformation. So I'm using a little bit more abstract notation here. It's not necessarily something coming from type theory, but it interprets type theory. Um, so for any such thing, I get a polynomial endofunctor. I start with a presheaf here. I pull it back over u dot. That's the presheaf of terms. And that pullback is simply taking the product and projecting down to u dot. Then I push forward. That is the right adjoint to pullback along p. And then I forget the indexing. That's the sigma. And this is the value p of x. That's that polynomial expression, p of x, broken down functorially. So that's how you do it. And now if you analyze this construction, you see immediately what the universal property is of this object. That is, what happens if I take any object and hom into here? What do I get? Well, what you get is this. If I take any object in my category, any object in the presheaves, it could be representable, and I hom in, what I get is a pair, first of all, a map into U, and then I make the pullback, which is the context extension, and then a map into the argument to which I applied the polynomial. So that universal, and, and that's natural in gamma. So that universal property follows from that description that I just gave you here. Let's apply the polynomial functor to U itself, the base here. So I have an expression like this, and using the universal property, what happens if I hom in? Well, what I get then is pairs consisting of a type in context gamma together with another type in the extended context gamma dot A for the first type. So this gadget, P of U, classifies types in an extended context. And now I'm going to use that to describe the pi type constructor, the product type. If I take my polynomial functor and I hit this natural transformation with that polynomial functor, I get another natural transformation over here. Now, if I have any maps, pi and lambda, making a pullback square, that's exactly the rules for the pi type constructor. That is the introduction, elimination, formation, and computation rules for pi types. So that's my claim. The proposition says the natural transformation, representable natural transformation regarded as a category with families models the pi types exactly if there are two maps like this from the polynomial making a pullback square. Now, I don't have time to go through the proof, but here's a kind of indication, which you can look at yourself if you like. Here's the type formation. This thing, this is the definition. This is a type in context. Then I form a single type out of it, which is, of course, the pi type. This is the same thing for the terms. And the lambda forms a term. And that term has this type, right? This is the typing of the terms. So that's the introduction rule. So the commutativity of this square is the introduction rule. And the elimination rule tells me if I have a term over here of this type, then it comes uniquely from a term back here by lambda abstraction. And the pullback condition tells me that that is un actually unique. And that's exactly the elimination and computation rules for the pi types. So that's a sketch of the proof. And now you can do exactly the same thing for the sigma types, except of course, the map over here is a different one. 
And it's an interesting one. Let's look at what this map is. I told you that every map in a locally Cartesian closed category produces a polynomial endofunctor. Now, that polynomial endofunctor can be composed with itself. And it turns out that polynomials are closed under composition. So what that, that means is P square is also polynomial, and therefore it's the polynomial of some other map, Q, which is what I've written here. It just happens that the map, and now the really, if I have a pullback square of this form. Okay, so to summarize, if I start with a pi tribe in the sense of Joyal, for example, a Quillen model category with the Frobenius property, then the natural transfer natural model associated to it by this adjunction, which I told you about before, will in fact be a category with families modeling sigma and pi types strictly. It even models the identity types, but I didn't have a chance to explain that to you. So it will model the intentional identity types. So this is then a strictification of that homotopical model that I started with, which gives a strict category with families interpretation of sigma, pi, and moreover identity types. So that's really a good place to stop. If we had a little more time, I would tell you something more about this structure of these pullback squares and show you that that is in fact something that's more familiar, namely it's a monad, a polynomial monad. And the monad laws correspond to some type equations. And then this pi type is an algebra for that monad. So, and the algebra laws correspond to some more familiar type equations. And my conclusion will be this. Let me define a martin Luff algebra in a locally Cartesian closed category to be a map, maybe, uh, for example, a natural model in pre-sheaves equipped with three pullback squares of this form, where these are the polynomials determined by the map. That's a martin Luff algebra. And my theorem says that if I start with a homotopical model of type theory, for example, a Quillen model category with the Frobenius property, then what it determines is a natural model by that adjunction that I showed you. And that natural model is in fact a martin Luff algebra, which moreover models the martin Luff identity types. So that's the whole story. And here are some references. Thanks. Thank you. So uh, let's thank the speaker with a silent applause. And I guess if there are any questions, feel free to ask. Unmute yourself and ask. I don't see, I haven't seen the chat. There is no message in the chat. So. May I? Of course. Um, first of all, thanks for the very cool talk. Sure. I have a question about um, what if you wanted to extend this procedure to other type constructors that are maybe, um, I don't know, for example, uh, inductive types or uh, W types and, and such. Do you have any ideas on how one could possibly do that? No, that's a great question though. I, I've thought about it a little bit, uh, but I don't have anything sensible to say, apart from the fact that I think it's a great question and something worth pursuing. It's not something that's, you know, known to be hard or people have tried or anything like that. It's more like nobody's looked into it. This is all new stuff. So it's a great topic for somebody to look into. All right. Thanks. Yep. You want to ask? Jacopo, I see you'll raise your hand. Pino, actually. Can I Hi, Pino. Hi, Steve. Thank you very much. It was uh, really very clear and very pleasant. Um, I just wonder, it's it's pre-sheaves from the beginning. 
Uh, have you tried anything with uh, some rodent topologies and get sheaves of some kind? Yeah, that's a good question. So, um, I, I haven't tried. Uh, Thierry, I know, has looked at sheaf models of type theory, and it seems to work quite well. And from my point of view, the reason that it works so well is that this is an algebraic structure which is stable under localization, under the left exact localization. So you do it on the pre-sheaves, and then you have the sheaves is, of course, a left exact localization, and it will preserve this thing and give you uh, another such algebra, Martin Luff algebra, as I called it, in the sheaves. And now, of course, another interesting question would be, can you get one in the pre-sheaves that's not quite right, and then sheafify it to correct it, so that in the sheaves, you get something that is strictly an algebra. And I think that's an interesting approach. And that's related to something that Thierry has done. There's a paper, a recent paper, it was in Lix, I think, last year on um, a stack model of type theory. And he uses a sheaf-like construction of stacks. So people have looked at it. It's a good idea. I think it could be exploited a lot further. Someone else? We have a little bit of time, so don't feel pressure to ask. But if you want time to formulate the question, take your time. <laughs> Maybe Steve, you can tell us if there are no other questions a little bit more about the monad that you... I'd be happy to, yeah. I am very interested. I think many other people are. Okay. I'll just go on and on until you cut me off, so... <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll try not to be too blunt. What um what time is the next talk scheduled? Or maybe that's... Mm -hmm. Eight minutes. Okay, so we have a little bit of time. Yeah, I'd be happy yeah. to tell you about that, that monad structure. So... This is kind of where I left off systematically was by squaring P. I said, I want to tell you how the sigma types work. And what I do is I say, this thing determines a polynomial endofunctor P. Then I compose P with itself. Because polynomials are stable under composition, there's another map Q, the polynomial of which is this composite. I put that Q right here, and that gives me the sigma types by a kind of magic that you have to work out. I mean, here's the explicit definition of it. And now what I didn't tell you is whenever you have two polynomials presented like this by maps, so this is presenting P, this is presenting P squared. If you have a pullback square between them, that induces a natural transformation between the associated endofunctors. In general, if I have a natural transformation, I make the endofunctor. Another natural transformation, I make the endofunctor. A pullback square corresponds to a Cartesian natural transformation. And therefore, this sigma type pullback square, which is the, if you will, the definition of having sigma types, corresponds to, here it is again, corresponds to a natural transformation from P squared to P, because this after all is the, by definition, the map that represents P squared. So this sigma type former is a Cartesian natural transformation from P squared to P. Now that should make you wonder, ah, what I wonder is a natural transformation from the identity into P. Well, the identity is a polynomial, and it's represented by this trivial map, which type theoretically is the rule for a terminal type with a unique constructor. So here are the rules for the terminal type. It's a type, it has a term, and every other term of that type is equal to that term. 
So that's the terminal type. And that's modeled exactly by a pullback square of this form. But now we know that that pullback square represents a natural transformation into capital P from the identity. So those two structures, terminal type and sigma type, correspond exactly to a natural transformation from the identity into P and a natural transformation from P squared to P. And now you're saying, oh gosh, that is a monad because that's the structure of a monad, a point and a map from the square to itself. In the, a monad is just a monoid in the category of endofunctors. Now, it's the structure of a monad, but what about the monad laws? So here's what I'm saying. A natural, transforma a, a natural model, representable net transformation, models the terminal type and sigma types just in case the associated polynomial endofunctor P has the structure of a Cartesian monad. And there's a little weaselly thing here in saying has the structure because I didn't check the monad laws. I just said it has the structure of a monad. But what are the monad laws? Let's unwind this thing and ask what those laws are. Maybe they do hold. So here's what they are. There. If you unwind the monad laws, this is the usual presentation of them in terms of functorial operations. If you unwind it in terms of the type theory, what it's saying is you have these type isomorphisms. Okay, let's look at this one. If you can read type theory, you'll look at this and you'll say, oh yeah, that's true. It's not exactly equal. It's equal up to isomorphism, though it's a canonical isomorphism. Also this one, right? The sum over A of the terminal type is isomorphic to A. That's one of the unit laws. And the other unit law says the sum over the terminal type of A is isomorphic to A. So the monad laws correspond exactly to these canonical type isomorphisms, which you can prove from the rules of type theory. You don't have to put them in. They, they hold for free. And so this structure here, which we said was a monad structure is actually a monad up to isomorphism for free. It's a, if you like, a pseudomonad, right? So, so for free, this thing is a Cartesian pseudomonad. And the same thing holds for this algebra structure because here, what am I doing? I'm taking P and I'm a capital P, I'm applying it to this map which happens to be the map that represents capital P, but no mind. I apply it and then I have a map back. That's exactly an algebra for this endofunctor. So this is this pi type constructor here is an algebra structure for the monad. And again, if we check the algebra laws, what do we get? We get some familiar canonical type isomorphisms, namely, this one, which pulls the sigma up out of the pi, and this one, which says the pi over one of A is A. So those are the algebra laws. They again hold up to isomorphism. And so this gadget is a very tight algebraic structure. It's a polynomial, a Martin Love algebra. It's a polynomial monad, which is an algebra, which is itself an algebra for that monad. Put those three things together, and that's what I call the martin Luff algebra, and that's what you get out of martin Luff type theory with sigma and pi and a terminal type if you apply that adjoint construction that I told you about. You get a martin Luff algebra. So that's my explanation of that. Thanks Very for cool. your time. Yeah. That was definitely worthwhile. Thank you for yeah. the explanation. It's very cool, isn't it? I. It's I a beautiful construction, yes. I, I do. I think it's just beautiful. And I don't take any credit for it. You know, it's like, it's just there. And I mm -hmm. happen to stumble onto it, but it's there. Thank you again. Also, perfect timing. Sure, good. So I guess we can break. clap your hands again, our hands again for you. Thank and you. Uh, Thanks. Um, it's perfect timing to introduce the next speaker. Of course, Joshua, if you need a couple of minutes, there's no problem. 
I'm going to stop sharing my screen and yes. um, uh, turn off my mic. Mm -hmm. See, thanks oh, again. Here, let me just give you a, this is a, a lecture from the hot conference, the slides for which are online, and some of which are similar to the ones I showed you. But this is a paper that you can look at if you want more information. This is another paper with my PhD student who wrote a whole dissertation about this topic, and that's what this is. And then this is a reference on categories with families, if you want to learn more about categories with families. So there's some references for it. Thanks again. Yep.